Today, two historic things happened. In case you missed the news, the price of oil went to zero. You heard me right. The price of crude oil, the futures contract price, went to zero. Now, that's a first in history. You say, how can that happen? Well, not only that, the second thing that's happened for the first time is that futures contract price of oil dipped to negative 40. That's right. They will pay you to buy oil. They'll pay you $40 at that point in time to buy oil. It is oil Mageddon. It is the Armageddon of oil, uh, at least for today. You can see here on this chart, historic price all the way from 1985 to 2020. And the historic low was $10. Then we got to $20. And when we got to around $20 again here, one of my online church members said, Pastor Steve, I believe it's going to go to $10. I said to her, no way. $10 is like, it's Armageddon for oil. It's Armageddon for the energy industry. And uh, not only did it go to 10, but it breezed through it. And it went to zero, unbelievable zero and then you can see right there it really nearly hit negative 50 the exact drop was fifty five dollars and ninety cents down on a day or a three hundred and five percent down now why is this bad if you're not in the oil industry you know people probably say hey i'm happy that oil is really cheap uh, for petrol the economy is not bad so in that case Maybe from the perspective of the consumer, you might say, you know, oil is cheap and the Bible says don't hurt the oil and the wine. Maybe that's good for me. That's good for us consumers. However, make no mistake about it. This is the fuse that could ignite a war. There are countries who depend on the sale of oil for their revenue. If oil is at zero dollar or very close to it, they are really hurting. And that is the cause to go to war. It's happened before. You know, history is prophecy. Especially biblical history is prophecy. It's happened before. You know, countries have gone to war over oil. You know, we've had two Gulf Wars. I was in high school watching the Gulf War of 1991 being televised. And we saw this picture for the first time where oil was just set on fire. You think, why would you do that? If you're Saddam Hussein and oil is your nation's commodity, why would you do that? Well, there's several reasons. One, you don't want your enemy to have it. Two, scarcity drives up price. Right now, we have a convergence of very, very low demand because of the coronavirus lockdown that's global. Little demand for transportation. Little demand for flying. And so you've got very low demand. You've got a glut, right? You've got an abundance of oil because you can't just turn oil on and off like you do a faucet, right? It costs money to turn it off. You can see that, you know, th this is an example here, this picture from the 1991 Gulf War. I mean, how do you turn this off? Well, this oil is gushing out and you can see it because, because of the flames. But if you didn't see that flame and that's being pumped out, it costs money to stop that oil from pumping out of the earth. And then it will cost money, even more money, millions of dollars, to turn it back on. So if you turn it off, there, there's a chance some of them will never be turned back on. You take a look at the timeline of how we got into the worst war in human history, World War II. In 1929, there was a U.S. stock market crash. And within, look at this, Within four years, Adolf Hitler became Chancellor of Germany. And then within 10 years of 1929, the Nazis invaded Poland, which sparked World War II. The elites use economic problems as an opportunity to bring in totalitarian control, like mass surveillance, mass tracking. They use these calamities these times of hardship as an excuse to take away people's freedom. And then they concentrate power, political power. 
And you know that power corrupts human beings and absolute power corrupts them absolutely. So you're looking at a timeline that if this is a repeat of history, we now have a crash of oil, the world's most important commodity, in 2020. And everything seems accelerated right now, but let's just be conservative. And we say, okay, within 10 years, there will come the worst war on earth. The Bible says that the next war will be worse than anything that's been seen before. So it will be worse than World War II. Can you imagine that? Within 10 years. Could be shorter, but within 10 years. That's what the pattern shows. So 2020 to 2030. Now that's very much in line with what I've been saying, that the next major time marker in prophecy is around 2032 to 2033, because that would mark the absolute... 2000th year anniversary of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. You know, the greatest event in God's mind is not Jesus' birth, even though that's God come in the flesh. His son came in the flesh. But the first feast out of the seven feasts is the Passover. And the Passover tells you that's the first feast God wants you to look at. That's the first thing he counts in his calendar. It's the symbol of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So the anniversary, the two millennia anniversary is coming up around that time. So we have a really bad war before. That could be the beginning of the tribulation or that could be the beginning of the mid-trip, you know, the middle of the tribulation, which brings people into the great tribulation. Make no mistake, something absolutely historic, something unseen before has happened. Oil, a commodity on earth, has gone to zero dollars. You say, now, how is that possible, Pastor Steve? Now, how can it go negative? You might be wondering, oil crash explain. How is it possible? Well, again, you've got coronavirus lockdown, reduce global demand. You've got storage capacity that's reaching maximum. So in other words, it costs money, it costs something like $250,000, I think, per, uh, they go by 1,000 barrels to store. Okay, so there's a cost to storing. So now... People who sell, right, they sell crude oil to the refiners so that it gets refined. They have to sell it to someone. They're actually paying the buyer to take the oil off their hand because there is such a glut, such an excess of oil. There's excess of oil at sea, uh, in tankers, and there's excess of oil on land. So this is why the WTI, Intermediate Futures, dropped to negative. This news headline says oil price goes negative for the first time in history as world runs out of storage space. See, there's plenty of oil, but nowhere to store. Next month, some 100 million barrels of oil will still be pumped around the world, with much of that having no place to go. As one commentator expressed it, there is so much unused oil sloshing around that American energy companies have run out of room to store it. There's no place to put the oil. What is this leading to? It's the global reset. It's the financial reset. I believe that Donald Trump is preparing for this because of the way that America is spending. First, they said it was a $2 trillion stimulus package. I heard today that it's going up to $6 trillion. I mean, who's counting anymore? If the government can print money like that, then what, what does it matter whether people pay debt? What does it matter if people pay taxes? And what's going on? It's almost like they're letting the whole system fail. They're letting the bubble burst. Why would they do that? Quite possibly because by the end of all this, possibly the end of this year, 2020, America is going to reintroduce the gold standard, the gold-backed dollar. There's been a quiet campaign to reinstate the gold standard, and it's getting louder. It used to be considered fringe, but Trump has really been surrounding himself with people who don't believe that it's fringe. And in fact, it's recognized in many countries. In the United States, since 2011, at least six states have passed laws recognizing gold and silver as currency. That means it's real money. Another three are presently contemplating bills of their own. The surprising success of Ron Paul, a Texas Republican congressman and an ardent gold bug, in 2008 and 2012 elections showed the potency of these ideas among the electorate. People are for this. And gold standard would mean that you can't just print money. Paper currency has to be backed by gold. 
Will Trump bring back the gold standard? Well, the gold standard hasn't been used in the U.S. since 1973. But in the last several years, there's been speculation that U.S. President Donald Trump could bring it back. Gold used to be real money, but because it's heavy to carry around, they replaced it with paper promises. These certificates were promises that you could redeem it for real physical gold at a bank. So that's called the gold standard, right? So paper was trusted. People trusted the paper to mean something, to value, to store value, because it was backed by gold. And this system was first introduced in Germany in 1871. And by the 1900, most developed nations, including the U.S., were using gold-backed paper currency. And this system remained popular for a long time, but it broke down during World War I. So again, world wars create a lot of change. A lot of what we suffer today in terms of socio-cultural changes were introduced by the consequences of World War I and World War II. So there was an agreement called the Bretton Woods Agreement, which would be the framework for global currency markets until 1971. The Bretton Woods Agreement was developed at the United Nations Monetary and Financial Conference held in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire. Under the agreement, currencies were pegged to the price of gold, and the U.S. dollar was then considered the reserve currency linked to the price of gold. So instead of saying all the currencies can get gold, now they say, you know what, all the currencies can get U.S. dollars. All we need to do is that we need to peg commodity prices like the price of oil to the U.S. dollar. Then the U.S. dollar becomes the de facto reserve currency of the world. And this is why U.S. has such a great advantage because of this petrodollar system. But the promise that the U.S. dollar would be good as gold, as they say, fell apart in 1971 when Nixon called for a temporary suspension of the dollar's convertibility into gold. Countries were then free to choose any exchange agreement except for the price of gold. And they set it very low. So what has Trump said about the gold standard? While it's perhaps not common knowledge, Trump has been a long fan of gold. In fact, as Sean Williams of Motley Fool points out, Trump has been interested in gold since at least the 1970s when private ownership of gold bullion became legal again. He reportedly invested in gold aggressively at that time, buying the precious metal at, get this, $185. So I think it was set at around $30 when they let the reins loose and gold was able to find its true value. At that time, it was $185. They say an ounce of gold should always be able to buy a man's high-quality suit. So I suppose at that time, you could get a suit in the 1970s for around $200. He did very well. He bought it very low, $185, and he sold it around $780 to $790 even. So he did really well off of that investment. He made it looks like around five times, five-fold multiplication. What would happen if America went back to the gold standard? Well, America would have to set the price of gold. And in this example, they said, let's say that gold was set at 500 per ounce. I don't believe it's going to be 500 per ounce because of the incredible debt that the U.S. has. They want to inflate that price as much as possible. So I think it's going to be around $10,000 per ounce, possibly by the end of this year. Again, I'm not investing in gold. I'm not asking you to invest in gold. I believe that our security comes from walking with Jesus Christ. But I'm just saying from a practical point of view, what the U.S. would need to do is set the price of gold much higher than it is, probably around 10000 And then $1, the value of $1 would be one ten thousandth of an ounce of gold. You get that? All right, one ten thousandth of an ounce of gold. And this would bring price stability. In any case, there's coming a financial reset. This uh, outrageous infinite spending, infinite printing of money, it cannot last forever. And they're doing it like they don't care. And if they don't care, it means that something is on the horizon. I think it's a gold standard. And I don't think that necessarily it's going to be the U.S. paper dollar. I think that they're preparing for digital currency. Here's an article from the Cointelegraph. They say Donald Trump just advertised Bitcoin after the Fed creates $6 trillion. Right? This article is from March 28. What they're saying is Trump seems to be for this quantitative easing to the point where 
paper money will lose its value. People will lose trust in paper money. They quote him as saying, the beautiful thing about our country is 6.2 trillion because it is 2.2 plus 4. It's 6.2 trillion. And we can handle that easily because of who we are, what we are. The leader of the free world feels that it's okay to print $6 trillion. Then reality is going to sink in with a lot of people who know that that's not sustainable and that's going to completely inflate your economy. It's going to inflate the prices of everything. So we're in a deflationary mode right now. That's why oil has gone to zero. Price of things will actually drop at the moment because demand is so low and everyone's locked down. So it starts out with uh, deflation and then it will go to infl uh, inflation when the price of everything will skyrocket. This is from Forbes. Shock US digital dollar proposals set Bitcoin and crypto prices alight. Bitcoin and cryptocurrency investors have cheered U.S. plans to create a so-called digital dollar as part of a massive coronavirus-induced stimulus bill. Bitcoin prices climbed up 15% over the last 24-hour period. If the U.S. were to create a digital dollar, it could be seen as a tacit endorsement of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, especially if it were to use Bitcoin's underlying blockchain technology. And what I said a couple of years ago was blockchain is a solution to a problem. A problem of trust and so it's not going to go away blockchain is here to stay it's who's going to use it how are they going to use it and when are the people going to adopt it the general population is not very educated about cryptocurrency it seems strange but it will take a calamity or a financial disaster to reset the system and when it's reset i have a a strong inkling that it's going to be digital Again, this is reading from Forbes. I'm not giving you financial advice. This is Forbes article. Bitcoin will moon if U.S. creates a digital dollar. With the long rumored digital dollar appearing to take shape this week, Bitcoin as well as other digital assets could be about to take a step toward mainstream adoption and potentially see the kind of interest that pushed the Bitcoin price to last year's highs. So hard to believe. It was only a year ago when Bitcoin was booming everyone was excited about it and what happened what happened what always happens the chicago mercantile exchange came in and right away as soon as those financial elites came in it looks like they manipulated the price of bitcoin and crashed it they did not want people to change over to bitcoin because they couldn't control it but if they can control it the blockchain technology is a solution to digital trust and to tracking you know, if the government wants to track money, paper currency and coins uh, is not doing it for them anymore. Let's get to the scripture. Again, we've been in Revelation 6 many times. And uh, I'm just hearing from, you know, respectable American preachers saying that we couldn't possibly be in Revelation 6. We couldn't possibly be in the seals because, and here's what they say. I respect them very much. They're not wrong in how they interpret because I'm not dogmatic. They're wrong in assuming that their assumptions are right. And that's the thing that I hear so often from American preachers. And I say that not to pick on Americans because I think it's, um, it's a case of your strength becomes your weakness. America is so Christian, America's had so many sermons preached to them that when they hear something enough times, they just automatically assume it must be right. And this is the problem. Instead of looking at something from a biblical lens, and questioning our own assumptions, we just think that whatever we do must be gospel. I do missions all over the world, and you can go to countries where American missionaries came, and they felt that uh, American attire was Christian, and what the native people wore was very unchristian. Let's say that the women was uh, the women were more exposed. Let's say that they exposed their breasts because they're breastfeeding. In many cultures, people don't really. They're not turned on by that, you know? I mean, Americans might be. So they thought that that was very bad. And in the message of the gospel, they came changing people's clothing and attire. You can hardly believe it, but you can go to Pacific Islands today where women dress in clothing that's from another century because they were told that was Christian. Well, that's the kind of thing that American prophecy teachers have done. They've put certain clothes on the prophecy and we can't take it off because it's just we, we are so used to hearing it now one of the things I just want to explain 
And I want to say again, I respect very much America's contribution. We all operate based on the knowledge that we have. This has been taught, and I lived in America, so I know very well the prophecy teaching in America. What's been taught is that all the seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls happen during the tribulation. So they say this so often that it must be true. One of the things that I question about it is very simple is everyone who teaches this believes that there's three and a half years in the tribulation, and then there's three and a half years in the great tribulation. Okay, so how do you fit the seven seals, seven trumpets, and the seven bowls here? And invariably, they do something that is forced. It's a forced interpretation. They say, well, the seven bowls represent the seven events in the great tribulation. All right, so then where do the seven trumpets fit? They say, well, the seven trumpets fit in the, in the tribulation, the first three and a half years. Then where do the seven seals fit? Oh, well, they fit in here as well. So then you've got something very unelegant, something that's very asymmetric. You've got 14 events here in the tribulation, representing three and a half years, and then you've got seven bowls here, representing seven events in three and a half years. So it makes no sense. If seven bowls represent three and a half years, then shouldn't seven trumpets represent three and a half years? And shouldn't seven seals represent three and a half years? And this is, to me, it's, it is so obvious that I said this, I think, way back in 2012. It might be one of my first end-time videos on YouTube. And I said, I'm not trying to rebuke or correct the wonderful prophecy teachers. I'm saying that maybe they need to adjust their model ever so slightly. And they don't even have to credit me. They don't have to say, I got this from Pastor Ciccolanti. Just think about it. It's far more symmetric. It makes more sense. It's a more elegant solution to say that Jesus said a lot about pre-tribulation events. Why wouldn't he say anything about it in the book of Revelation? And when I compare Matthew 24 and Luke 21 pre-tribulation events, they match really well, the seven seals. I said this a long time ago. I've had this teaching called the 22 future events of Revelation for many years. But I want to just show you a real quick summary of it. I think you should listen to the whole teaching. It's four hours long. I go through all the chapters. But let's start with the timeline. It's very simple. The book of Revelation itself has 22 chapters, and they are basically in chronological order. You have to add the fact that there are scenes that are not on earth. Where is that? In chapters 4 and 5, chapters 14 and 15. And you can also add 21 to 22 is really in heaven because it's future eternity. So I put nice little clouds there so you can see that. So from the perspective of earth, you can see that chapter 3, if you're on earth, connects to chapter 6, right? Same as if you were in the mid-tribulation, chapter 13 would connect seamlessly to chapter 16. It doesn't matter what happened in heaven, you wouldn't see it. 14 and 15, this is kind of like a movie where you get to supernaturally see someone else's perspective or go somewhere else far away. It's just providing background, a backstory in a movie. But from the character's point of view, 13 goes to 16, right? In the same way, chapter 3 connects with chapter 6. It's really not that hard. Why would God put, say, the rapture here? Well, he wants to tell you there's a rapture, but then he also wants to then tell you about the 22 future events of Revelation, seven seals, seven trumpets, mid-tribulation, and then seven bowls. That makes seven plus seven plus one plus seven is 22. So again, 22 chapters, 22 events, 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, 22 is the number of end time, the number of the Jews, and wherever I go, all over the world, hotels, airplane seats, restaurant tables, I keep getting 22. That's what I get, 22. I'll go to the 22 level. I'll be at gate 22. I'll be seated at seat 22. It's maybe God's prophetic confirmation that I'm supposed to talk about it. This is all in the teaching uh, on the 22 future events of Revelation, which amazingly, now I even heard Jeff Berwick of the Dollar Vigilante quoting the book of Revelation. I just heard him read chapter 13, and he says he needs to study it. Well, I don't know any better resource than the 22 future events of Revelation to help him understand this. It's a chronology. 
There's a little bit of a breakup in the chronology because of the change in scene, but it's nothing unusual in terms of how literature works, how movies work, how storytelling works. So once you understand that, then you can also see that the way I would adjust the model for prophecy teachers is that you can now assume that the church age connects to the pre-tribulation signs of chapter 6. Once you understand this, you know that it's not impossible for the seals to be broken and for us to not yet be in the tribulation. Now, there's another assumption that American prophecy teachers make is that when you get to the first seal, it's the Antichrist. Now, I'm going to read it to you because it doesn't say anything like that. Listen to what God said to us, chapter 6, verse 1. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, I heard one of the four living creatures saying, with a voice like thunder, come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. Does the word Antichrist appear there? No, not at all. So if you think the white horse is the Antichrist, that's just your assumption. Could you be right? Sure. But would I be dogmatic about it? So what was given to us? As what we know is that he had a bow and he had a crown given to him. Now, the word crown in Latin is corona. Is it possible, I mean, this is so blatantly obvious, is it possible the first seal is broken when the coronavirus is given to the organization where all the people who come out and speak to us wear white robes? And people can't see it because they assume Oh, Pastor Chicolanti, if you say first seal, you're talking about tribulation. No, I'm not. I'm talking about the pre-tribulation seals as Jesus told the church to watch for. Why wouldn't Jesus talk about the pre-tribulation seals in the book of Revelation? Of course he would. What else do we know about the white horse? He went out conquering and to conquer. It doesn't say that it's military. In fact, one of the things that I've always heard, which I think is correct from the old time preachers, is that, isn't it interesting, a bow was given, but no arrow. So you've got a bow, you know, a conquering symbol, and yet where's the arrow? So it looks like whoever this is goes out conquering the whole world, in other words, controlling the whole world without a weapon. And has the WHO head been able to control the whole world? control transportation, movement, businesses, economy, schools, vaccination, have they been able to control without an arrow, without a missile, without even shooting a bullet? Yes, they have. So has the first seal been opened? It looks very possible to me. So what should we do? First of all, we should get back to reading the Bible. We should get back to understanding the Bible without prejudice, without all of the past assumptions from people who probably love God but didn't have the knowledge that we have today. I mean, who would have even known the word crown matches coronavirus? So I'd get back to the Bible, stay in peace, read the Bible, maybe for the first time in your life. You know, our ministry is very practical, and I think the best thing that you can do right now is to give your life to Jesus Christ. Make sure that your sins are forgiven because it doesn't matter how much money you're going to accumulate on this earth if it goes down to zero. And this is what the price of oil is really telling us. It's a true measure of the economy that's not been manipulated by any central bank, any government authority. The price of oil went down to negative. When true price discovery is allowed to occur in a free market, guess where the price of oil is? Zero. And that right there is the harbinger. That right there is a sign of things to come if there was no manipulation by the central banks. If the economy was to actually have true price discovery, we're finding out the economy is functioning at negative value. So would I put my hope and trust in the world? No, I'll put my hope and trust in Jesus Christ. He has given us his word. What I would also do during this time is to really get close to God by reading the Bible. Read His Word. This is His gift to us. If you don't understand the book of Revelation, if it seems intimidating to you, go and find on Vimeo the 22 future events predicted by Revelation. 
we did this. We started uploading a lot of our DVD content to Vimeo because our online church members were asking, Pastor Steve, can we get it uh, instant access? Can we save on shipping? So we looked for a platform, and right now we like Vimeo's offer. The way it works is that Vimeo has a container. So the 22 future events of Revelation is a series that's within this container. And in this container, there are four videos. So you can get it all in one shot right here by all, or you can get them one at a time. You might just want to check it out first. So we listen to our online church members and we're working with them. If you want to join our online church members, there's a great spiritual family that you can belong to. And just come over to patreon.com slash my last name, Chikolanti. It's a real family. We're not just passively giving videos. We're interacting and talking. A lot of my content comes from my online church members' questions. Sometimes videos that I'm about to put out, I run by my collaborators and they tell me some more information and we adjust. When you become an online church member, they call it a patron, you get over 250 exclusive posts. Our recent posts include, let's pray together at 20 hundred hour for 20 minutes. Let's do at least that while we're in lockdown. You get an update about the oil crash. Another recent update was how Apple and Google are partnering up to track us. You get online church service every week. You get to hear about what dreams and visions God has shown me and others. You won't miss anything that this ministry is producing, even if any of the other social media platforms censor us. Everything will be here. Get into an online church community.